Hi, my name is Kari Nado, and I'm really excited to be with you today and to talk about food allergy and this wonderful book that I've written with my co-author, Sloan Barnett, who's a mom and a lawyer and has done wonderful work uh, in and around the news media. And we are so excited to be here today to discuss with you about the book and hopefully how it can be used by folks like yourselves to be able to help you or your children or others that you know have food allergy. So the first question that comes up often is how can you know about the fact that people do have food allergies and how is that different from food sensitivities? And we talk about that in the book in terms of how to diagnose food allergy versus food sensitivities. Both are very disabling diseases. Food allergy, however, can lead to anaphylaxis and fatal or near fatal reactions. And so we spend a lot of time in the book about making sure that everyone knows if you have food allergy, you have a chance of having a severe reaction at some point in your life. And so please use an injectable epinephrine device if your doctor diagnoses you with a food allergy. And now I'd like to move forward with immunotherapy, because if you do have a food allergy, one thing that we want to make sure gets through in the book is that there's hope and promise now delivered by science to be able to help people. And what we talk about in the book specifically is oral immunotherapy, although there are also other types of immunotherapy, patch therapy as well as sublingual immunotherapy. And there are many other types of drugs that one can use now that are available in clinical trials to help people with their food allergy. And oral immunotherapy has been around for many years. We talk about this in the book. It works by giving small amounts of doses over time to build up what we call immune muscle to take that food allergen for which the body has a misdirected, unfortunate misfiring of an immune response against that food allergen. But over time, if you give it in the right amount, very slowly and steadily, and you increase it ever so often in a doctor's office with trained personnel, and best to do with an FDA approved drug, then you can get up to a higher level of food. And with that, you can have a change in your threshold for reactivity so you don't have to worry perhaps as much as an external ingestion level of food. So that's how OIT works. And I think everyone can be a candidate for oral immunotherapy. However, please check in with your doctor, check in with a trained professional who is a board certified licensed allergist as to whether or not you're a good candidate. It takes a team approach. It takes a lot of people. There are safety issues as you move forward with this. You can have mild to moderate or even severe reactions during oral immunotherapy. And so you have to be very careful. There are some new blockade agents that are moving forward in clinical trials. For example, anti-IgE and anti-IL-4 receptor alpha blockade, as well as even antibodies that one can take to block the reaction completely, which we talk about in the book. All of these are in what we call clinical trials right now. And I would urge any of you to go on to a website called clinicaltrials.gov and you can look up those clinical trials in your area that allow you to participate for your given food allergies. One thing that people ask me a lot about is if you're going to do oral immunotherapy, should I just do it to one food or to all the foods that I'm allergic to? And I would urge you to know that what we've done at Stanford in particular, as well as what's been done now around the globe, is that if you're going to do oral immunotherapy, try to do it to all your foods. Make sure you know what foods you're allergic to. But in addition, you now have that hope and promise that there will be a company called Aladab that is moving forward its product that is available for multi-food allergic people as well as single food allergic milk, egg. I know that it's exciting that the FDA approved the first peanut allergic drug or palforzia for children with peanut allergy. But it's not just about peanut allergy that we discuss in the book, it's about a lot of other allergies as well. And we need to make sure this is the beginning of the end of food allergy. We have a toolkit that we provide in the book, but please talk to your local doctors, please talk to your board certified allergists, and please make sure that you look into clinical trials if they're available uh, at your um, location. Some questions that a lot of people have had as well are, why do some people suddenly develop an allergy after being able to safely eat the food allergen for a good period of time? And that happens frequently. Actually, Ruchi Gupta from Northwestern and her colleagues 
surveyed thousands of people across the US, and we found that about two children in every classroom has a food allergy. And that's important to know, that's a high number, that's an epidemic. But what we were surprised to find out is that with the same types of questionnaire tools, we found out that 10% of adults also have a food allergy. And with that, of that 10% of adults in the US, 50% said that they did not have that food allergic reaction when they were children. 50%, however, did have it when they were a child and they didn't grow out of it. But importantly is that 50% that developed it newly. And we're now studying that. We have identical twins in which one developed a food allergy newly in adulthood and the other one did not. It probably has to do a lot with environmental exposures, not when the children were in utero or during childhood, but actually during adulthood. And choices in diet, making sure you eat fresh vegetables, making sure that your skin is moist, making sure that you have good uh, diversity of diet and proteins, and then also making sure you don't smoke or vape or be exposed to a high level of air pollution. These are all good things to be able to provide a tool set to decrease your risk of potential food allergies later in life as well. And some other questions come up in terms of skin prick tests, as well as the blood tests as diagnostics. We talk about that in the book as well. Um, it's well known to board certified allergists that we have just so much in our toolkit for diagnostics, but we shouldn't rely on any one thing to be the framework by which we diagnose whether or not someone has a food allergy, except the food challenge. The food challenge is the gold standard. Skin prick tests can be used, but if they're negative, you don't know exactly if the person could perhaps react to that later on in life. But at that point in time, a negative skin prick test is pretty much almost 99.9% .9 predictive of the fact that you do not have an allergy, as long as that skin prick test was done in a facility with trained personnel in a board certified allergist's office. Importantly, if you have a positive skin prick test though, that could be a false positive. And so that's why people do need to talk to their allergists and see whether or not they need to do other testing. Blood testing has been done now for many years and it's an important way to understand different levels of allergic responses. However, sometimes if you have a negative blood test, i.e. that means that your IgE level was found to be negative, that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have a food allergy. So again, interpreting blood tests yourself is, in my eyes at least, dangerous and one should always talk to a trained professional as to what these tests mean and how you can best help your child. I also want to note that just because someone has an egg or a milk allergy and because there's a common myth that people will outgrow that inevitably, it's not necessarily true. So we go through in the book myths and myth busters and I want all of you to know that I would love to hope that people could outgrow their food allergies but that's not necessarily the case and it's getting less and less now as we move forward in the timeline with people with food allergies. So we talk about a lot of things in the book, including the fact that if you think you're gonna grow out of a food allergy, please discuss it with your doctor and don't assume that carry an injectable epinephrine device at all times. When children have symptoms of behavioral changes, most of those are related to, in my mind, a lot of um, anxiety around taking foods. We wanna be super careful about that. I do have patients that say that when a child will eat a lot of sugar, they can behave differently. And I do think that that can occur. I think that being compassionate towards people that have food allergies, it's a very disabling and tough disease to have. When we think about the pandemic of COVID and all of a sudden the general population has to be worried about going out to eat at restaurants, going out on a plane, being careful about wiping down surfaces so that you don't touch something that could expose you. People with food allergies have been living with that for their life. And so I'm hoping that as we move forward and try to combat COVID, and just as we are trying to combat food allergy, we also need to be compassionate about the fact that when you do have a food allergy, it's difficult. So I'm hoping that the book also provides some help to those families that don't have food allergy but that we are dealing with this as a society, whether or not you're a coach or a teacher or a grandmother or a grandfather, we need to understand more about how to help people with food allergies. When someone has a food allergic reaction, it is a very defined reaction. It does not include headache. It does not include 
typically any type of fever. It does not include behavioral changes outside of the fact that someone could get dizzy or someone could complain of an upset stomach and be in pain. And those are the behavioral changes that we see in our center when someone has an allergic reaction to food. Those allergic reactions usually happen within two to three hours of ingesting the food. If you have a reaction later, talk to your doctor, but typically the reactions to foods occur within that time frame if you have a food allergy. And that means that you have a molecule called IgE that lights the fire behind food allergies that could induce this. A lot of people for hundreds of years have been studying this, and we talk about that in the book, about all the wonderful researchers that have provided the data that we are able to use to help us understand food allergy diagnosis, how to prevent it, because we now know some causes, and also how to treat it. Now, we're not there yet perfectly. We don't have a cure for food allergies yet. We wanna make sure that anyone that does undergo therapy is managed by a very well-trained team and that they should know that we don't have a magic wand that someone could be cured for life. We don't know that yet. But we are looking at something called biomarkers to predict if someone can be cured for life. And that's exciting. So we go through in the book a lot about the history, a lot about all the wonderful researchers that have laid the groundwork to be able to attempt to get to the end of food allergy. And importantly, is to help parents and families with and without food allergy understand what this disease is about. When you have a food allergy, it is more likely that you have other types of allergies like eczema or allergic rhinitis, otherwise commonly called hay fever as well as asthma. And for those children with food allergy and asthma, sometimes that can lead to more severe reactions. We also know that people that don't get access to injectable epinephrine pens, for example, the underserved or people that don't have health insurance, they can be at high risk for anaphylaxis. So we wanna make sure that everyone can get access to these life-saving medicines. And we hope that through FDA approval of many medicines, not just Balforsia, but many to come, that that will allow for systematic scalability of reproducible data that will allow accessibility of drugs for all people with food allergies. We've talked a lot about food allergies and what we call IgE-mediated diseases, but there are also other diseases like food sensitivities and other allergies that you can go to the allergist for. And those are things like eosinophilic esophagitis, food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome, mast cell disorders, and those are all important to talk to your doctor about. We do give you some resources in the book about what those other diseases are and how to differentiate them and how to tell the difference between food allergic reactions versus these other diseases. We are seeing more common food allergens than what originally were around just even six or five years ago that we always knew, or at least I was always trained, that milk, egg, tree nuts, peanut, soy, shrimp, shellfish, specifically all shellfish with shrimp and fish can be very common in causing food allergies. Now we have sesame, now wheat has also become an allergen. People can be both sensitive and allergic to wheat. Allergies to wheat can cause anaphylaxis, however. Corn, we are seeing some allergies to corn, but one should look at whether or not they're allergic to the corn or is it a sensitivity to some of the corn sugars. So we wanna make sure that when people know about food allergies, it's typically to the protein in the food, not to the sugars and not to the fat. There is one food allergy that we talk about in the book called alpha-gal allergy, and that's caused and is associated with a sugar in meat and a tick bite. And you have to have kind of all those things to occur in order for alpha-gal allergies to happen for as much as we know. And it's mostly in the southeast of our country. But it's important to know that typically, and the majority of food allergies are caused by protein allergies. And when we talk about maltodextrin, corn syrup, dextrose, those are more sensitivities to those particular elements. But in the book, we do give some, hopefully you find good dietary recommendations, which is try to avoid preservatives, try to avoid sugars uh, for as much as you can, try to enable your gut to have good microbiota, get good vitamins, have fresh vegetables, have fresh fruit, really important to help 
maintain just an overall good health. Maintaining overall good health is good for a lot of things, as well as exercise and other items, eating good food. But in addition, that's not necessarily going to cure an already given food allergy. So think about a lot of things when you talk to your doctor. But in addition, ask about what good dietary changes you can do. Allergies and asthma are on the rise. Uh, some of the tree nut allergies are doubling every 10 years. We are seeing that it's less likely to grow out of allergies. For example, people have researched that. It's important to know that many countries now across the world are showing that they have food allergies. It's just not in the US and Australia and the United Kingdom. It's in Europe, as well as other countries like China and Korea. And so we want to make sure that people understand what could potentially be causing these. And we talk about the five Ds in the book. Diversity of diet is key. We've got to be able to start giving babies small amounts of servings of food proteins that are food proteins that are the same food, food proteins I've spoken about, milk, egg, wheat, soy, peanuts, tree nuts, shrimp, fish, sesame. And it'd be nice to have all of that in one particular item so that that's easy to feed for a child. And we should start at about four to six months of age. It doesn't have to exclude breastfeeding at all. One should do this while they're breastfeeding. If you can't breastfeed, we talk about formulas in the book as well. But importantly, that diversity of diet we have found, as well as many others, to decrease the risk of food allergies. Preventing dry skin to happen is also very important. And using right emollients to replenish the skin, we feel, as a new developing field to try to prevent food allergies. And we're excited about some clinical studies that are being funded by the NIH to do so. We also talk about the diversity of the microbiome and having good, what we call dirt, the third D in um, and around decreasing the risk of food allergies. And then vitamin D is also important. Many people around the world have looked at normalizing vitamin D levels to try to decrease the risk of food allergy. And then finally, the fifth D is a dog. People have found that by growing up with a dog in the first year of life, that can try to decrease your risk of food allergies, which is all exciting. So that says that a lot of environmental aspects and behavioral changes in our diet, in our practices can help. And in that dry skin, we should try to also reduce detergent use that is bad for the planet as well as uh, bad for baby skin and bad for our skin. So we uh, mention some of the resources one can have in the book, and I hope that you'll find that helpful to you. We do know that there are a lot of opinions out there. We do know that there's a lot of science out there that has led to the statements that were made in the book. And if anyone has any suggestions or if some scientific discovery is made and that changes what we've written in the book, we're going to be adding that to the book's website because that's helpful. As we know, everything depends on good data and good information to be able to provide to the public. And we want to base anything we say on science and on good science. And so the book also provides resources, but also citations for everything that we talk about in the book. Any strong fact is related to a scientific discovery that's been published in what we call a peer review journal. I hope that was helpful. I hope that you'll like the book and please uh, feel free to blog and contact the book's website, and I hope that you and your families will all have a wonderful fall. Thank you so much for your attention.